afternoon or good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Daphne Lei. I'm the director of Illuminations, Chancellor's Arts and Culture Initiative. Our goal is to bring arts and culture to every corner of the campus and to all students, regardless of your majors or disciplines. So I am very delighted and honored to welcome our very, very hot guest today, <laughs> Charles Yu. Uh, who knows, who's the, the superhero? Who knows how to navigate the science fiction world and the interior Chinatown? So you can learn about that today. But uh, before we start, I wanna thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Humanities Course Program and its director, Jonathan Alexander. I don't see you, Jonathan, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, who's also the uh, Chancellor's Professor uh, in English and Informatics. And also, uh, uh, also Chris Fan, uh, the Associate, associate uh, uh, Professor uh, of English. Uh, and the format today uh, will be a conversation uh, between Professor Fan and then with Charles uh, for, you know, for a certain time, and then we will have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so uh, we should start. Let's please join us and welcome uh, Charles Yu. I'm actually gonna do another introduction for you. Um, so usually when, I, I guess when these happen in this room, um, the introducer's usually at the podium. Um, and I think that like the, the sort of spatial distance between the introducer and the introducee, uh, it's kind of like a protective buffer for the, for the onslaught of praise that's gonna come at you. So um, because we're doing this in a conversation format, because I'm sitting right next to you, I thought I would eliminate that distance and just make it maximally awkward for you <laughs> and just praise you to your face. Um, directly. Um, so thank you, uh, Daphne uh, and Illuminations uh, for sponsoring this event. Thank you to Jonathan Alexander for um, and Humanities Corps. Thank you to all of you for coming on this, you know, spending the last few hours of this beautiful day here um, uh, with us. I think you're in for a real treat, though. Uh, so Charles Yu's novels and uh, short story collections include Third Class Superhero from 2006, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe from 2010, Sorry Please Thank You from 2012, and Interior Chinatown, which was published in 2020. And that same year, Interior Chinatown received the National Book Award for Fiction. In addition to the National Book Award, Interior Chinatown was also longlisted for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, and it was shortlisted for the Le Prix Médicis Étranger, which is a French award, that's uh, given to an author whose fame does not yet match their talent. This is what Wikipedia tells me. Um, so Charlie also received the National Book Foundation's 535 Award. And in recent years, that was just last year, the, the, the under 35 award, right? <laughs> and in recent years has been very focused on writing for film and television. He's been nominated for two Writers Guild of America awards uh, for his work on the HBO series Westworld, which I'm sure many of you have seen, and has been in the writer's room for shows like Lodge 49, Legion, and more recently, the Disney Plus series American Born Chinese. So right now he's working on a series adaptation of Interior Chinatown for Hulu, um, which we'll talk more about in, in just a moment. Um, okay, so, so that's Charlie's uh, CV, just in, in, in a nutshell. Um, uh, but since I have the uh, introducer's prerogative here, I thought I would uh, share a, a more personal story about, about how we met. Um, because it's also a story about um, how much I admire Charlie's fiction and why I, I admire it so much. Uh, so back in tw 2011 or 2012, uh, I was a graduate student. I was working on a chapter of my dissertation on uh, science fiction by Asian American writers. And I was at City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco, this very famous bookstore, and I was just browsing around, and then, and then I saw it. I saw this very copy of How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, and I was like, that is exactly what I'm looking for. It's like announcing itself to me. So I picked it up, um, and I started reading it immediately, and I was totally engrossed, and by the time I got back to Oakland, I had already finished like half of, half of the novel. Um, so as many of you in this audience know, it's a story about a protagonist named Charles Yu, whose father invents a time machine and then runs away to some unknown point in time. But it's about so many other things besides just that. 
Um, it's about parent-child relationships. It's an immigrant narrative. It's about Taiwan and Taiwan, Taiwanese Americans in this very coded way. It's also about capitalism run amok. It's about class conflict and resentment and disappointment. It has elements of cyberpunk and the postmodern novel and the experimental novel. And it's also infused with this kind of deep sadness that suffuses you know, every page, the pores of every page. But as you know also, many of you in this audience, it's not a downer. It's absolutely hilarious at moments. So when I was reading this book on, uh, on the BART train um, going back home, I had one of those experiences that everyone who reads Charlie's Fiction has, which we just discussed with Ashley over there, um, which is that I found myself laughing out loud one moment and then immediately being moved to tears, sometimes within the space of a single sentence. Uh, so this is what is so special about Charlie's Fiction, about his short stories, about his other novel, Interior Chinatown. Uh, one of the most astonishing things about How to Live Safely in particular for me uh, is that more than any piece of fiction that I've ever read, it really captures the feelings of immigrants like my parents who, like Charlie's parents, um, also emigrated to the United States from Taiwan after 1965. And it also captures, this novel also captures the, the sort of peculiar feelings of the children of these immigrants like, like me and Charlie. And like so many of the students that I've, I've uh, introduced to this novel and Charlie's other work, um, and so this is the, the novel that I'm teaching for the Humanities Core series, uh, I saw myself and my family depicted it in a way that I'd never really seen before. I can't remember exactly how I got into in, in touch with, uh, with Charlie after uh, finishing the book, um, but I remember I knew that I, that I just had to talk to this brilliant author with this amazing voice and this really pitch-perfect sensibility. Um, so it was at 2000. It was in 2014 at this point when I finally reached out to him. I finally mustered up the nerve to reach out. And he very generously made some time for me. So uh, we met up for lunch in Los Angeles. I was, just happened to be down there. And uh, we had this really lovely, wide-ranging conversation about his background and his family, how he came into writing. And we'll cover some of that ground in our, in our conversation today. And since my first encounter with his work, I've, of course, read everything else that he's, that he's written. Uh, and those experiences just continue to confirm my initial sense that, um, of the uniqueness and the perceptiveness of, of Charlie's voice. So I've, I've watched with some pride over the years, and it's been you know, almost a decade, maybe more than a decade since we last met. Um, and I've watched uh, you know, Charlie's star rise over the years, and the awards that he's won, the bigger and bigger projects, the higher and higher profile projects that he's been involved with. And I would argue that you know, even though his star has continued to rise, that uh, his fame is still no match for his talent. So it's been, a wonder, it's been really wonderful to see my sense repeatedly confirmed that Charlie and his writing are something special. And you'll see exactly what I mean uh, over this next hour or so. No pressure. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A um, at the end of this, and, uh, and also plenty of time for book signing. So those of you who brought books, um, uh, there will be an opportunity for Charlie to sign. I will say this, though. Uh, those of you who are in uh, Humanities Corn are going to be coming to the event tomorrow. Um, maybe hold back on getting your, your copy signed if there's a really long line, okay? Because um, there will be an opportunity for signing um, tomorrow as well. So anyway, I'll shut up now, but uh, everyone, please put your hands together and welcome again Char Charlie Yu. All right, so I'll, I'll just kick things off. So this is not Charlie's first time here at UCI. This is not his, his first time in conversation uh, with me. The first time he was at UCI was back in, 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 I think it was 2016 or 2017. It was an event that Jonathan Alexander put on with um, Cheryl Vint, who's at, at UC Riverside, and we had a conversation then. And I remember you, uh, you uh, were proposing to do a reading, and it was a reading of a draft of uh, a section of Interior Chinatown called, uh, called Interior Golden Palace. You didn't, you didn't um, end up reading that, 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 that excerpt, but obviously it made it its way into, into this award-winning, wonderful novel. And so we'll talk a little bit about the novel in a little bit, but I thought maybe we could just sort of beginning, begin like towards the beginning <laughs> and, and just talk about, um, like your relationship to writing, like how did you come into writing? Um, maybe like how did writing, the idea of being a writer make sense to you? What kind of meanings did it have to you when you were growing up? Um, yeah, if you could just, you know, I guess, tell us how it all began. <laughs> sure, well thank you for being here. Thanks everyone, it's really an honor and thanks for the kind words from uh, both of you. And and just the opportunity to get to come, I, you know, my family and I, we live in Irvine, and this is a, an amazing institution. I hope my kids could come here someday, but I know it's very hard to get in, so. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's um, I have, 
I, I think I was a very early reader. My mom says that I used to say that I surprised her one day from the back seat of the car. I, she said, you know, in her telling, I get younger and younger every time. I was like, three days old or something. But she was just like, I started reading. What well, she heard me babbling from the back seat, and, and apparently I was like reading billboards. I don't know if this is true, but the, it's an origin story. And um, but I remember also just like dragging books around that I didn't read. I just dragged them around, <laughs> um, which I still kind of do. And and but I, I you know, at growing up, I just always thought. I don't know, I had this feeling like I wanted to be a writer, and you were just telling me a second ago about um, a similar story, and I, I just feel like it was almost a compulsion from a pretty young age of like, I, I needed to express something. So I, I remember we took a class trip to Yosemite when I was a kid, and um, and I just wrote poems, because you know, I was like, inspired by the nature, and my teacher found them and, and put, sent them to like the local newspaper. And so I was like published, and I was only eight, which is like a, too early to get published, you know what I mean? Like sets up expectations. Um, and then in college, I went to Berkeley, and I minored in creative writing, and so I wrote a lot of poems there. I, I don't write poetry anymore. I stopped after I finished undergrad for some reason. I just never wrote another poem. But um, but yeah, I think you know, it, in a lot of ways, I just always felt like there was this kind of space inside of my head and inside of my heart that I had to sort of carve out that was very private. So writing really started in a very sort of private way and I wouldn't share it. I still don't really share it until it's pretty much done with, with almost anyone. You started out writing writing poetry. Um, when did you when did you start writing fiction? And I guess also like when did you have a sense that what you were producing was 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 good? I mean, you must have had a moment when you when you thought, okay, I can I can go with this. Like I can probably do something with this. But yeah, when did you start writing fiction? When did you realize that you were good at it? <laughs> um, I I, uh, I, th I think I I want to say the first thing that I remember writing was I was doing a summer internship, at like a political office, and. This, this is actually a pattern that will repeat throughout my career. Instead of doing my work, I was, <laughs> I was writing. Procrastination. And, uh, don't, yeah, don't follow that advice. But um, I know, I, I mean, there sort of was nothing to do. I, was, I had just graduated from high school, and we were, you know, basically making copies. I remember back then, we would, what we had to do, I worked for like a, in the field office for a senator, and we had to like take the news clips that were about the senator and cut them out of the newspaper and tape them and then like make a copy and fax it. <laughs> this is so old school that like you probably can't even imagine what I'm talking about. Tape and like faxes. And um, anyway, there was a lot of free time. Yeah, people are like, what is that? Um, Paper? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I, and I remember writing a little uh, like one paragraph story about an orange. I don't know why I thought that would be a good story, but um, so that was the first thing I wrote. And then when I went to Berkeley there, so I, I minored in poetry and the system there, I don't know if it's similar here, is you have to apply to get into these workshops. So you send in writing samples. I didn't have samples like most people who are 18. You know, I, I didn't, I'd never done it before. So I started applying to the poetry workshops. I, a couple semesters, I, I got rejected at first and then I got in eventually. And then after a couple of semesters of that, I, I tried to get into a fiction workshop and I didn't get in, and I just gave up. I just didn't actually keep going from there. Um, I just thought, well, I'm I'm in these poetry workshops. I think I like this better. Poems are less words. You know, I'm a little bit lazy as a student, so I was like, oh, this will probably be easier. And um, no, I, I like poems better. And um, and then when I, so then I graduated from college, and I uh, applied to law school, <laughs> and um, it. I went all the way through law school. I didn't write any fiction or poetry. I was just, for once, I was actually studying. But, um, but I did read a lot of fiction. And then the summer before I started practicing, uh, this is 2001, you know, you have this sort of summer between when you graduate and, and you, then you take the bar and then you start work. I spent a lot of that summer reading fiction. I, I you know, studied for the bar some, and, um, but I really just, was enjoying my last time where before I thought I'm gonna have to go and work at this law firm and I'm never gonna have free time. So I read a lot of fiction and that's when I really got this itch. I, I you know, started reading short story collections and I was like, what is this? It, it felt so, because I didn't read 
much contemporary fiction in college. You know, I, I read some, but I didn't minor or major in English. I didn't read like sort of contemporary novels. And so I got really excited by what was being published then. And, um, and that's when I started writing short stories, right? When I started working, because I think I really felt like I needed a creative outlet. Again, it's a sort of private space for myself. Um, I don't think, you know, there was one, I, there wasn't like one moment where I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm good at this or I can do this. But I mean, certainly I remember getting my first acceptance, you know, from a journal after getting many, many rejections, you know, getting a story accepted. And that was really thrilling. Um, I, I have a lot of follow up questions. Um, <laughs> but can we back up a little bit? And uh, so you wrote a story about an orange. Uh, could you could you could you explain? Do you remember that story? How how it worked? Yeah, uh. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the orange is on a table and then falls off the table. Okay, okay. so it was a who's, who's the protagonist in this story? Is it <laughs> the, the orange? orange? Okay, <laughs> how did the orange feel about falling off the table? I mean, I don't I don't think it really had much of a <laughs> feeling about it as an orange. I remember describing the texture of this orange's skin. I mean, I yeah. think I was, you know. I had no idea what I was doing. I thought it was an experiment. I didn't, you know, I had no storytelling instincts really other than yeah. having watched a lot of TV growing up. Yeah. Um, and, and read a lot, of course. Um, awesome. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you want to read it, I can show it to you. No, I'm just kidding. I have no idea where it is. I'm sure I'm going to dig up away. those eight year old publications, too. <laughs> um, uh, that, so you spent a lot of time writing poetry, and it sounds like you sort of initially envision yourself as, as as a poet or someone who writes writes poems. So um, does that, I, I guess, uh, has that sensibility, do you think, continued into your fiction writing? Yeah, I think so. I, th I still think of myself as like a sort of failed poet, you know, who like, I the kind of sound of words matters to me, you know, in my fiction, even in like writing for TV and film, like I, can get really hung up in you know parts of a script that will never be said anything other than dialogue won't be said on screen obviously but you know that even that prose matters to me when it really sort of shouldn't it's not a good use of you know time but um i just sort of get hung up on rhythm and and sound and so i don't know that i have like the discipline or you know that a like an actual poet has but i think bringing some of that to, to me, it matters. Like, I'm not someone who's principal. You know, I think of not that there's this is a strict classification, but if there's some writers that are very plot focused and very good at that, or, yeah. you know, um, or uh, scene or other things. And I'm, I'm not just even talking about sort of flowery prose descriptions of things. I just mean, like, literally, I, I, I think on some level, all of my prose. I care more about how it sounds mm -hmm. than than I care about almost anything else. I see. I see. Yeah. No. That that makes so much sense. I think anybody who encounters your writing, that's one of the first things that they encounter is like the uh, the rhythm and the the focus on um, on the sort of audible quality of the language that you use. Um, I wanted to, to 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 ask a little bit about the transition between um, between lawyering and 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 writing. I think when we first met um, back in in 2014, uh, you were in house counsel at um, at a tech company, right? Uh, and at some point, you 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 made the, the 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 decision to to go all in with writing, right? Could you could you kind of walk us through that process? Yeah, if it doesn't dredge up too many uh, <laughs> no, hard no, memories. No, no, I was working in Irvine at the, by then. Um, I had my family and I had moved from LA and um, and I had at that point actually published three books um, uh, and you know the reality of it just sort of economically was that I am too slow a writer and my books didn't sell enough <laughs> um, to from for that to be sort of my day job so unless I could somehow get a position say teaching um, I was still definitely very much in need of a day job. And I was actually quite sort of content with, you know, I had developed this kind of way of making it work, you know? I mean, I, I worked and then I found time to write and it did come at the expense of sort of time with friends and family or having any other hobbies <laughs> whatsoever. But, you know, writing mattered that much, so I spent a lot of time on it. And then 
Um, somewhere in there, around the time when How to Live Safely was published, I had started working with a, like a TV and film agent. Mm -hmm. They represent the rights to the book. Um, and they're one of these big Hollywood agencies, they also represent you know, screenwriters. So um, like in 2010, I started to actually go on meeting, go to meetings where I would meet producers and executives and people that could hire me or, or could maybe um, put me on a show or something. And um, in 2014, I got my first staffing job, which was a bit out of the blue. You know, it was a, one of these kind of like, is this really happening? Because I wasn't really looking for the job, you know, which is kind of crazy. But it, I, my wife says, and she's right. I have like, I have incredible timing, <laughs> like no, no skill. I just happen to always be in the right place at the right time, and, um, and this was true. I think in 20, like I graduated from in law school from law school in 2001, and it was an incredible time to be a young lawyer. <laughs> like any, they would hire, they hired me, so they would hire anyone. And um, same with, I think, being a, a novelist sort of around then, if you lived in LA, they were just looking for TV writers, because as people, you might not be too young to remember, but there used to only be a few shows on TV, not one billion shows on TV. Um, and we've now kind of on the other side of that bubble, but for a while, they couldn't get enough writers. And so they were hiring novelists who had, you know, and playwrights, and I, I was even in writers' rooms that had poets said, <laughs> like, yeah. is amazing. And it's like anyone, a journalist for sure, and like anyone who could sort of tell a story or was a writer. And so I was lucky enough to get a job on, on Westworld. Cool. Uh, I definitely missed out on that bubble. But um, could, could, you, could you describe the experience of walking into a writer's room for the first time, like what that was like, sort of, because you write in such a, you've written in such a different way, right, before you enter that writer's room and just like what that adjustment was like. Yeah, it was like part dream, part, oh wow, this is a job too, you know, like the pressure. And, and so I kind of lived in the dream for a while and then the, eventually I realized, oh right, there's, we have to like deliver a product and, and there's a lot of sort of iteration on it. So, but walking in for the first time was just, um, you know, I had left my law office you know, where I used to sort of dress like this every day. Like this was weird to put on pants and, <laughs> and button up a shirt and everything, Pants. but <laughs> um, I mean, I live in Irvine, like I wear shorts yeah. 300 days out of the year pretty much. So, um, but you know, it was incredible to, so I got hired by these two showrunners who are a married couple and then there were other, there were including me, six writers in the room that they hired. And so it was a team of eight and then we had like, just like a conference room, much smaller than this, like the size of a sort of, you know, small, conference room and we just basically sit around the table and like there's whiteboards and there's cards and and so we start to um kind of hash out the story and so we start with world building you know which i think maybe is relevant to our discussion a bit and it's like they had made a pilot already and it's an incredible thing that they showed us they'd already shot it actually so we had a sense of what they want we have a, not just a sense we had a clear direction of what they wanted what we didn't have was you know the rest of the story you know and um, so we, over the course of many, many months, the, you know, the, the group basically came up with the story. But yeah, the first day was just really cool, also really scary, because I was kind of bewildered at first about like what the rules of that is, like how do you work in this way? And also just team, team writing is very strange for someone who works like yeah. me, you know, alone. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it seems like, as you were saying before, your relationship to writing, um, you know, uh, for most of your early years was very private, right? Something you wouldn't share with people. But here, all of a sudden, you're in this environment where you're writing, you're writing together. There is, there is really no privacy in, in, in the writer's room, I guess. Um, but, I was, you know, I was also wondering, and, and another theme uh, that, that you mentioned before is that, um, you know, you would write when you weren't supposed to be writing, when you were supposed to be doing something else. But now writing is, is, is your job, right? So I was wondering if you could talk about how your relationship to, to, to writing, to being a writer changed. Like, was, that, was it a smooth adjustment going into the writing room? Was it, was it pretty rough? Um, like, yeah, do, do a quick ethnography of the, the writing room too. But, you know, I'm obviously more interested in, in your personal experiences of, 
um, of making that adjustment from a private solitary writer who does writing <laughs> just uh, in, in order not to do the thing that they're supposed to be doing to like making that your job and writing with all these other people. Yeah, it's a definitely a little bit of like, be careful what you wish for, you know, um, uh, because once something becomes a job, it, it, it just has a kind of pressure and um, there's um, a sense in which it's, it, you know, it's, if it's obligation, it just doesn't carry the same, I don't know, sense of freedom or fun. And then on top of that, you're like writing for, a, especially a show, you know, if you're sort of at home writing a movie by yourself or something, that's different. But when you're in one of these rooms, you know, you're, there's a kind of hierarchy to it. You know, there's very senior people and I was brand new and there's sort of, a, there's a lot of process to it. You know, there's a lot of kind of visible and invisible rules to like, how does this work? How do we pitch things? What are you allowed to pitch? You know, like, and so learning kind of how to navigate that was, was interesting. I mean, I, at first I was having so much fun and then I kind of, realized I was having too much fun. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I'm having fun because I don't realize that everyone here is kind of really on pins and needles because they want to keep their job or they want to do a good job or they want to impress everybody. And there's rules that I'm breaking. I didn't even realize I was breaking rules. And so I was like, I don't know what I don't know. And so as that started to catch up to me, it became not so fun. <laughs> but, um, but I still have to, you know, I mean, 10 years into doing this, I still definitely love it and I, Remind, I have to remind myself that I love it, but it's, it, you know, it's still to me my, um, it's such a different activity, you know, um, to write for a visual medium versus writing, you know, prose fiction or prose nonfiction. It's yeah. completely, it seems like there's more overlap than there is, I think, but there really, it's a, you can be, I think, very good at that and not be good at all at writing a book. Right. And I think vice versa as well. Um, yeah, so a lot has happened since that uh, that first the, the first time you entered a writer's room. So now you're now you're a showrunner, right? Uh, so you're the showrunner for the the adaptation of Interior Chinatown. And so I thought maybe we would just sort of shift the conversation to talk about this book a little bit. And I thought maybe the way we could sort of start talking about and talking towards um, your your work as a showrunner is to, to to give everyone a flavor of of the novel itself. So. Um, to do that, I thought I would actually just read the, the the first couple of pages, and the first couple of pages. I mean, it's it's they're 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 quite short. They're just little snippets, um, but uh, uh, you know, I'll start with the the epigraph, right? So this is an epigraph from um, a book about Chinatowns, the history of Chinatowns by Bonnie Tsui, um, and it uh, and it says, if a film needed an exotic backdrop, Chinatown could be made to represent itself or any other Chinatown in the world. Even today, it stands in for the ambiguous Asian anywhere. And Act One, the, so the, the 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 novel is divided into these acts, and it's written in um, uh, chunks of the of the novel are written in the uh, visual style of a screenplay. And something I've been telling my students in humanities course is that a lot of your stories are are visual objects as well as um, as well as uh, literary objects. So Act One is called Generic Asian Man. Um, interior Golden Palace. Okay, <laughs> this is the first page. Ever since you were a boy, you've dreamt of being Kung Fu Guy. You are not Kung Fu Guy. You are currently background oriental male, but you've been practicing. Maybe tomorrow will be the day. Next page, Interior Golden Palace. Ever since you were a boy, you've dreamt of being Kung Fu Guy. You are not Kung Fu Guy. You are currently oriental guy making a weird face, but you've been practicing. Maybe tomorrow will be the day. Uh, and then the next page, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. This is a, it, it, I'll just show you the this, this sort of formatting. The, the page on the left here, you see it's hugging that, that right margin, right? And it says, uh, you take what you can get. You try to build a life, a life at the margin. And so it's written on that right margin. A life at the margin made from bit parts. Uh, and so there's that, that kind of pun on bit parts, right? So you're making a life at the margin out of these, these pieces, right? But bit parts also referring to extremely minor roles that don't have proper names, but are just Kung Fu guy or Oriental male. Um, so yeah, I, just, I thought I would just read that and kind of give you an opportunity to you know, tell us a little bit about, um, about the novel and uh, yeah, and um, what inspired you to write it, kind of its origin story as well. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And uh, you have a great reading voice. You should <laughs> read audiobooks. Um, I, right? 
Um, sure. Hire me. <laughs> I guess you're a professor, so you, you used to. Um, I, I, so it took a long time to write that book. I, I started it, I mean, as you mentioned, I, I threatened to read an excerpt in 2016 or 2017. Threatened. That was. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, but I had started it even years before that. Um, and I think what I, you know, the, the real sort of genesis of it was um, wanting to, well, I guess there's a little story attached to it. So I had published this book after How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, the short story collection you mentioned, and I was doing a reading of it in Boston. And um, <clears throat> afterwards, someone came up to me and was, um, was like, uh, very, you know, in a very sort of, non-threatening way but was like why do you think that you write about race in such a coded way and i was like oh <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very you know a little bit destabilizing when a stranger comes up to you at reading and like kind of has your number and then says something that sort of spins you out mm -hmm. and so i said get away from me no <laughs> it's like um no i said do I? You know, and so I mean, I, I took that to heart, and I spent the next several years like trying to figure out why, and also then I think that there's a long winding road from that to wanting to write that book. But um, uh, I think where it led was the kind of voice of Willis, you know, the protagonist. I really thought there's a voice that I don't hear a lot in fiction, you know, and this background character, um, and this specifically an Asian American male sort of character who uh, at that time, and remember I'm starting to write this book in 2012, 2013, there really were very few representations of Asian Americans on TV and film, but definitely Asian American men and or boys. Um, what's the problem was I took so long to write the book <laughs> that the culture sort of passed me by because all of a sudden there's Asians everywhere, but um, uh, which is a good thing, but it also was a very weird thing because even as I've made the show, it has taken a couple of years. It's like TV is kind of like almost dated the book, you know, and so, but that's where it started is, is the idea of like, is this an interesting metaphor or framework or, or just voice for understanding something about the psychology of, you know, someone like Willis, and I'll, you know, to be frank, someone like me, like to to sort of explore internalized feelings of I'm not a protagonist, I'm not a main character. W where does that come from? You know, is that is that external? Is that internal? Is it both? So, yeah, uh, you know, I want to spend a little time talking about this kind of weird parallax experience of you know. Um, when you started writing a novel, as you were saying, uh, Asian Americans uh, weren't a thing, especially in, in mainstream media. But now, you know, with 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 films like Everything Everywhere All at Once, it's there. There's a kind of um, cachet um, to the Asian Ameri American experience. So, what what has it been? And I mean, your your uh, Interior Chinatown winning the the 2020 National Book Award. I mean, had a lot to do with it as well. You know, with the with this kind of uh, rising prominence of Asian American stories. Um, could you just talk a little bit more about what that experience has been like? Like what it's looked like for you as a, you know, from the perspective of someone who's been writing for film and television, who's been developing projects for film and television. Um, you said, you mentioned that, you know, when you sort of first started entering this world, it was actually way back in 2010 and 2014 was when, you're, when you first entered the writer's room. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk us through that kind of weird parallax experience, um, what that's been like? Yeah, it's it's very weird. I will say, like, I remember having a meeting in 2011 about how to live safely, and a big sort of producer was like, hey, maybe we'll make a movie out of this. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're going to ask where that's going and <laughs> if it went anywhere in a second. Um, and I was like, amazing. And I remember thinking I wasn't going to have anything to do with it because at that time I had zero experience, and it was just the sort of much more common thing of like, okay, well, you know, thank you very much. We'll take it from here, and, and we'll check in with you every couple years if it's going anywhere. But I remember thinking that like, I can't imagine that. I literally can't imagine them making that story. They're not going, that can't be, a, the lead character of a movie can't be a nerdy Asian guy stuck in a time machine, you know? Like that's not gonna happen. And um, 
now, you know, it's like, it's possible. It still would definitely be an uphill battle, but it's like, and so that's happened very quickly. And I think the experience of sort of being in the wave of these things, um, f both in, in terms of books and in terms of TV and film, is, I mean, it's just not, re it, it feels very unreal. It's like, is this, um, and so even kind of putting aside whether or not it feels good or bad, I guess it also feels a little scary, to be frank, mm. you know, to have an opportunity to have something like a show that could reach, you know, in, in success, millions of people, but mm -hmm. at a minimum, many more people than will likely read most of my books or, you know, probably any of my books. So it, that's a really weird thing and it also feels like, <clears throat> yeah, it feels like almost like the dream of like when you're at school and you don't have pants on. You know, it's like a little bit like you're exposed in a way that isn't super comfortable because like, well, did you really mean it? Because yeah. if somebody reads a book, they came to that book, unless they were assigned by a professor. <laughs> but usually it's a voluntary experience and you're in a warm room and even if they hate the book, that's a private thing. They put the book down, but now, especially with the internet, I mean, I guess this happens with books too, but the discourse around shows can just be so scary of like, well, this person didn't do it right, you know? Like, so I, I sort of, that, that, I don't know if that's the parallax exactly, but it does feel weird that something like this that would have been so niche that I wouldn't be, I wasn't scared to publish that in the same way that I'm kind of scared of, yeah. you know? I, I didn't think that's where you would end up going <laughs> with this, but um, yeah, I mean, something else that's happened in the last 10 years is that so much more is being expected of representations in um, television and film, and um, clearly as showrunner now, you're experiencing a lot more of that pressure as opposed to like in the writer's room, that, that pressure is distributed or even like not heaped upon you, it's heaped upon the showrunners themselves. Um, but yeah, maybe could could we hear a little bit more about about that anxiety? And uh, I guess specifically, like with the development of Interior Chinatown into a series, like how, um, yeah, how was that anxiety sort of manifested in this process? Um, stress eating. Okay. <laughs> Jelly beans, gummy bears, gummy, <laughs> gummy bears. bears. Gummy bears. Um, I think you know it's it's trying to not like stay topical exactly, but it's mm. trying to make sure even as like, because I think it's a losing battle to try to like, or losing race, I'm, I'm now mixing my metaphors, but to try to chase the culture or chase where things are. You know, it, the, the story had its genesis. I am of the generation I am of, and you are all, you know, of your generation. And so I can't, to try to like, you know, I think pander or to dilute the story would just result in something sort of not authentic, I think. So it's like trying to, but at the same time, you, telling a story that's like no longer sort of relevant in some ways, it's like I think there's a way potentially to highlight the aspects of it that still maybe will resonate. Mm -hmm. You know, which, I, which is to say, I, I do think even despite an uptick in representation and in like Asians and Asian Americans in pop culture, it's not as if that wipes out, you know, long history of discrimination, of of internalized, you know, stereo stereotypes, internal or external sort of um, sort of um, cultural baggage that comes along with all of that. And so, I I, th I think there's still a story to be told. And I and I th and I think the the trick for me is trying to wrap in what's happening now too into the story in a way that the conversation evolves because it's really complicated. You know, it's like, do I feel like, um, do I feel like Willis can still matter? Yeah, I, I, I hope so. So I don't know, I don't think I answered your question, but I talked no, no, for no, a that while. Was, <laughs> that, that was great. I, um, I, was, I was wondering, so, so we were talking before and um, so you're in post-production right now, right? So um, uh, kind of about halfway through post-production it sounds like a little bit more over the, a little bit further past the, the yeah, halfway point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when, when did you start photography and all that stuff? We started in January of 2023. Oh, wow, okay, okay, so it's been a, a while. Very long process, yeah. Uh, are there, is there like, are there like one or two experiences um, in this process that are like really memorable to you that stand out as like really positive or like really like fraught? <laughs> Anything that you would wanna share that, um, uh, yeah, that can give us a peek inside the, the process for you as a, as a showrunner? 
Yeah, I mean, um, there have been, yeah, many. I'm trying to think of a couple that are really memorable. I mean, I think, you know, at one point, we were shooting the pilot uh, in, in LA at Fox Studios, and, um, you know, the two of the leads of the show are Jimmy O. Yang and Ronnie Chang, who are two comics that I've enjoyed for a long time. And they're, so there's this scene where they get to do a lot of fun sort of action stuff. I won't spoil it. But, um, and the director of the pilot is Taika Waititi, who's been a favorite director of mine for a long time um, since his first film. And like, so I'm just sitting with them and I remember they're just like kind of basically riffing on the thing that I wrote, you know? and making jokes out of it and like making it better to be frank and and I'm just thinking like this is great this is yeah. like how it should always be like you should get to collaborate with people I mean I think what it is really is that uh, one of the differences that I really love about this medium is it's that script really is kind of just a blueprint for them to make something out of it's not really a piece of writing on its own that's what's hard for me to let go of but it's also an important thing to realize is that it's a it's kind of a living document in a way, you know, not for everyone, not for every show, but for for that scene, for this kind of tone, for, a, you know, a comedy scene. Um, it's something that people are going to put into. And I think having that kind of connection and realizing that we were there to tell the story of this character, you know, who was in my head years ago, was really amazing. You know, like really just like you just think the universe is like, what happened you know like how did i get this lucky and why are these people <laughs> you know and then then on the flip side it's also scary because you're like oh every word i write matters because they're like well what did you mean by this uh, yeah i mean that it's just such a well uh chosen and amazing kind of uh, uh, uh set of people to be working with and i think just like perfectly tuned and chosen for 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 your voice and for this uh for this novel um so at the end of that you were kind of talking about the the, the relationship between uh you know writing the novel itself and then adapting it for for television and as a showrunner so as i understand it you're not involved directly in the writer's room like um uh in, insofar as like you're writing every line and writing um all of the all of the scripts is 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 that right or are you pretty pretty closely involved no it varies mm -hmm. I, um for me it's like it's true you kind of typical thing is the showrunner oversees the writer's room yeah but then people go and write their episode and then they give it back to you and then you kind of do your own write rewrites so that it uh sounds more like one voice basically and then as you shoot it you kind of have to rewrite it again for all kinds of reasons that have nothing to do with just like we couldn't get that location so now it takes yeah. place in a garage instead of a cafe or something so yeah. there's that kind of thing um so there's a lot of writing that happens, uh, rewriting that happens from the showrunner typically. So I see. Yeah, I see. it's kind of a blend of a bunch of voices. Like man a mix between managing writing and doing writing yourself. Yes. I see, yes. I see. So in, in terms of the, like, is it, is it possible to draw a straight line between, you know, what happens in, because this, as I said before, so much of this novel is written in the form of a screenplay, right? And so it kind of is asking to be adapted um, uh, for the screen. Um, is it possible to draw a straight line between this novel and then what we're going to see on the screen uh, in the in the Hulu adaptation? Yeah, I think it's a departure. I think it's a you know sort of springboard into the world of yeah. It's uh, yeah. It, it will like if you've read the book um, or just are familiar with it, it won't seem like a different story, but it goes to a different place and sort of navigates it as a 3D space instead of kind of a linear book. Are there are there any moments in the novel that you're particularly excited about uh, about about sharing with people in in um, in Hulu form? <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, my head is pretty much swimming with yeah. moments, so I can't put my finger on one. Probably, um, other than just the idea of I don't know having representations of Willis's parents, you mm -hmm. know, because I think that was a big part of it is his parents are immigrants and my parents are immigrants and i think more than willis they are very unseen yeah. still i think yeah. even with like it's one thing to have a movie about crazy rich asians you know yeah. or movies that have lots of martial arts but to watch two you know um asian immigrants you know have a sort of their kind of 
their own interior life and their own domestic life mm -hmm. and watch that as a story that's worth telling. Mm -hmm. And I don't, not, I don't know yet if that will be successful dramatically or mm -hmm. if it will resonate, but the, the opportunity to tell the story of what I think are still very largely invisible characters, yeah. um, especially, I mean, at least in sort of Western mass media or, or American TV. Yeah. Um, can we talk about some other projects that you're working on right now, like film and television? So you mentioned that years ago you had some initial conversations, very, very early conversations about uh, about how to live safely, adapting that. Sounds like that's in the proverbial drawer right now. But um, are there, in, in our conversations, you mentioned a, a Wong Kar Wai project with FX, um, if you don't mind me mentioning that. Um, but any, yeah, anything else that, that you're working on right now that you're, that you're super excited about, that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I did tell you that, and I'm, I, it's, it's, it's really an amazing thing, again, where it's like, I went to, I took one film class at Berkeley, I'm no cinephile, or I wasn't before, and we got to watch some Wong Kar Wai movies, and then I went and watched a whole bunch more, and like, the idea of like actually working with them was mind blowing. So a few years ago, um, we started working on something together. So you know, uh, which is incredible. It's not. I can't. I don't know yet if it will be made. Like we have, you know, talked about it. And sort of mind blowing to work with. Um, you know, or as a genius. Um, and, um, but that's kind of another weird thing about this world too. It's like you can work on something for years. There's a very good chance that you know. Well, most of it will never see the light of that. You know, most of what today in film development is is um, trying something, and then you know they only make some percentage of it. So, um, but yeah, it's been incredible. I, I have gotten to adapt some of my other um, stories, you know, into features, and we'll see if they make them. But um, you know, that exercise has been cool. Awesome. So you know, just kind of like. Nearing the end of our, our conversation, I, I just wanted to talk about two last things. The first is the uh, is the Betty L U and Jin C U Creative Writing Prize, which you started in 2021. If you could um, uh, talk a little bit about that, because we have, I think, probably potential contestants here. Yes, yeah. Um, it's it used to be for students. Now it's opened up, and um, there's a website, so you can go to TaiwaneseAmerican.org, and there's a kind of um, Requirements, rules, I don't know what it is. But there's certain criteria. I mean, it, it, the writing has to have some connection to Taiwan, either the writer or the subject. Um, and um, yeah, I, my parents um, from Taiwan, and uh, my mom passed away in late 20, um, oh my gosh, late 2022. <laughs> um, and so um, what year is it? <laughs> OK, yes, OK, that's right. Thank you. Um, I am a time traveler. I didn't know if I. <laughs> um, but yes, so I think she was um, sick for a while. And I think my mom was always my biggest fan. So like my book sales have dropped a lot since she yeah. passed away because no yeah, one's just is. buying my, <laughs> my books on bulk and giving them away to all the nurses in the hospital, uh, which is literally what she did. She just would just stacks of and she's like, here, here. Every doctor, every person that came in to clean her bed, you know, like got a copy, got a copy of the book. Um, and people are pretty nice about it, you know, because it's like, what are you going to do? It's a um, nice lady gives you a book, but um, I don't know what happens to all those books. Like, I imagine <laughs> they're just like, how, you know, what can I get on whatever, eBay or something? Um, but it's a, it's a writing prize, and it's, there's different categories, fiction, uh, nonfiction, poetry, and yeah, I mean, I, I just, it's been really fun. It, it did start with students. I think the idea was to try to, um, you know, foster a sense of community and, and give people, more than just like who gets the prize, it like gave a chance for people that maybe didn't have an avenue or didn't feel confident that they wanted to send something somewhere. And so through it, I've met a bunch of students um, and, you know, some, we'll do a Zoom usually of anybody that entered, you know, because, mm. It's not like a you know, like thousands of entries are pouring in, but it's it's been really kind of rewarding in that sense. I hope for the students, but definitely for me. Yeah. Awesome. So um, again, it's the Betty L U and Jin C U Creative Writing Prize. So if you go to TaiwaneseAmerican.org, you can find the the guidelines. I think that this year's um, submission deadline has already passed, um, but uh, yeah, definitely for next year. So the so you creative writers in the audience definitely. 
put it on your radar. Um, last question. So is there any new upcoming writing from you in any form, fiction, essays, anything that you want to plug? <laughs> um, I want to plug your book. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Well, I'll tell everybody what the what I wrote in the inscription uh, for Charlie. It, I, I wrote, your books inspired this one. And, it, and it's really true. I think there's a way in which um, this book could be read as a, um, this might creep you out, this might freak <laughs> you out, but as a, an extended close reading of, of Charlie's work. Um, so oh. thank, you for your, thank you for your writing um, and, in, in, and inspiring me. You know, it is match your book with, with <laughs> it is very crazy to be here with you at Irvine <laughs> because that conversation you were a PhD student and you yeah. were thinking about writing some of the things that I think like have DNA that ended up here right I yes mean, that, absolutely yes so yeah. now here we are sitting and you are a professor yeah yeah or yeah, you, yeah. yeah 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 time decade <laughs> <laughs> that's a decade ago uh, you look great by the way <laughs> time has not passed for you you might indeed be a time traveler so it was autobiographical after all <laughs> like it, like or like I was arguing I was not arguing that I'm just kidding um, okay so you know uh, th thank you Charlie so much for that wonderful conversation I think now we can uh, open it up for for uh, a few minutes of Q&A before we shift over to book signing so are there any questions Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, my first question is, um, unfortunately, I was pretty unfamiliar with your work before coming to this event, but what intrigued me was your background in screenwriting, um, just because I have a friend who's currently um, in a program to become a TV writer. So I was wondering if you had any advice about breaking into the industry or even practicing your craft uh, whether that be for TV writing specifically or even for writing in general. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, if your friend's already in a program, that's that's a you know, obviously a great way to start. And um, I think the for me, it really comes down to. I'll give you a little practical advice, and then I, something less practical. But um, I think you know, the is practice. <laughs> um, this is not a precious genre, you know. Um, it you kind of can't hold on to stuff. I think I, like so. I think going up that learning curve just means writing a lot of it, reading a lot of it, watching a lot of stuff, and um, not being afraid to kind of move on from something if it's not working, um, and meeting a lot of people. I think being in Southern California helps a lot, to be honest. So you can do it from anywhere, but it helps to just kind of be around it and send things to people, meet people, especially people of your, I think people think, how do I get this to big wig producer or to the studio head? And it, I think it's usually it's something much more organic than that, which is you meet a bunch of people your own age and you start to make connections and you kind of come up together. And it, sadly, not sadly, but I think correctly, that takes time and patience and a lot of hard work. So, and I think in terms of what I see, especially like having read a lot of submissions for like people to hire is voice. I think that's the one reason why so many novelists did get hired and continue to is they do have something which is you have to sort of have a sense of your literary voice that I think can be missing sometimes. When I read something that's very well constructed, you know, and it's not that it has to be cynical or anything, but but if it's like really sort of competently done um, in terms of like, oh, I could see this on TV, but um, that's not as interesting to me usually as someone's voice because you will learn that and people are very good at that. I'm not particularly good at it to be honest, like constructing a sort of thing that's very producible and, and sort of clear and easy to follow. As I'm, I've learned very painfully to my <laughs> detriment that like, but I do have voice and I think that's actually, uh, if someone wants to break in, I think it's a, a much easier way to break in is like just having some originality to your ideas or to your tone that, um, will stand out on the page because there's, you know, there's thousands of people trying to send their stuff out. I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, hello, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question was just mainly, um, I'm currently reading How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. I'm really, really enjoying it, and I'm just wondering, um, because it seems like to have like a lot of, um, like almost to be like a parodied form of science fiction in a way while still being science fiction, I was just wondering if you had any science fiction book recommendations or either that or like just books that inspired the book since it's been very fun reading it, so. Um, wow, that's a great question. Ooh. Yeah, I, I, you know, um, I don't know if inspired. I mean, I, I think like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, yeah, and I think the idea of science fiction and humor is always um, just, that's the nexus of those two things has always been a lot of fun for me. Um, has anyone read um, We Are Bob? Or we are my, my, my son is listening to it on audiobook okay. right now. He wakes up at 6.30 in the morning and wakes me up to unlock the iPad so he can listen to it. <laughs> I'm like, dude, why do you wake up so early? He really likes it. Um, it's a lot of fun, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I think, you know, I, I can't remember, ex I mean, the, the book that most directly inspired it is Slaughterhouse Five. So I think that's, if anyone hasn't read it, um, definitely read it. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, I enjoyed a lot of parts of your book that were like very funny and gets like emotional in the next part and has me tearing up. One moment that stood out to me, I'm kind of curious about, was the karaoke part of Country Roads. I was kind of curious, like what inspired that? Um, and just, uh, just want to hear more about your process for writing that little section. Yeah, um, when I was a kid, my parents would like hang out with their friends um, and they'd have these like, you know, get togethers at someone's house and back then, it was really popular to have this huge, kind of bulky karaoke machine that they'd roll out. And um, it, I don't think it registered for me at the time, but it definitely did much later when I was old, that uh, they always sang John Denver. Like, they sang a lot of it. And they loved, like, the carpenter, like, they, I mean, like, my parents and their friends. My parents were not singers, but, like, their friends who were always, you know, like, kind of drunk <laughs> like they're drinking they're 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 singing like um i guess what would be american pop music of the 60s and 70s because that's when a lot of them came and i think that music meant a lot to them um and i also thought it was interesting you know in a few ways like that they would have this attachment to music that to me is like well that's not your culture but i'm like of course it's their culture you know like my they're like my dad has now been here for over 60 years, you know, or almost 60 years, and um, and so I, I think that, and I, and I think that song in particular is, I, there's so much longing in it, and it's about home, and like the idea of um, people in a new country trying to build their own lives, you know, and become Americans, singing this incredibly sort of essential American song, I guess, right? But at the same time missing, or maybe not feeling like they're at home yet. And so um, I think those things all just made sense to me. And it didn't, it didn't make sense when I was a little kid. I was just like trying to play Nintendo or whatever, you know. Thank you. Hi, just a quick question. Um, could Willis be autobiographical? Like, does him having, or does having him be like a generic Asian male depict your life or background in some way? Like, like, did you feel like being a lawyer was something that a generic Asian male would do? Like, for example, to please family? But then you broke away from law and became something more creative, more important by being like an author. Thanks, yes, good question. Um, I mean, I don't know that an author is more important than a lawyer. <laughs> uh, it depends on who you ask. But um, I'm married to a lawyer. I can say that. Uh, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> um, but yes, I, 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 your question's well taken. Like, I think um, yes is the short answer. I, I think there's definitely an element of like I identify with Willis very strongly. I mean, and maybe that's obvious, but I don't know that you know. It's it's not as if that's autobiography in. Um, 
in any kind of way I can put my finger on, but it's, I think his, his mindset is something that someone of, I, I would say, my generation very much identifies with, and I would say probably resonates with Asian American guys of that. You know, I, I, I don't know, you know, but I, I think um, there's probably something to the experience of being um, like that, whether it was walking into law firms for the first time, certain workplaces, or even, you know, even when I went to school, like, I mean, I went to Berkeley, it was pretty, there was a pretty, you know, high percentage of Asian Americans, even when I went um, back in the late 90s, but like, or mid 90s. Um, um, but um, for a long time, I felt like that was the most sort of salient feature, you know, like, I was the Asian guy in the group, or in a room full of lawyers, if someone was like, hand this to the guy, and like, which guy? <laughs> They'd be like, the Asian guy. You know, I mean, that's, and so that consciousness of like, standing out in that way, um, that's definitely something I identify with. And I think that's, you know, p more than any particular job, or, you know, other kind of autobiographical facts, that, that psychology is sort of what Willis is to me. Hi, um, I came in a little late, so I apologize if you had already discussed this earlier, but um, I was first introduced to your work actually through your short story, Fable, a couple of years ago. Um, actually, I think I read it right out of college. I was really not happy at a law firm I was working at. Um, but uh, that was kind of my portal into your work. And I admired so much um, the play with form there and with most of your work, major uh, the majority of it somehow engages with like the constraints of form. Um, just question about your writing practice, like how, when you approach it, are you thinking proactively about the form it will take first or does the content come first, like the container versus the content? Just interested in your thought process there. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Um, great question. I, um, sometimes one, sometimes the other is a short answer. Um, I would say when I forget one for too long, it, it, I usually go down a, a bad road. It's, for me, it, um, the two have to sort of be, and this, is, this can be a very limiting thing. I, I don't know that this is always great, but the two have to be fused in a way that I feel is like fundamental. <laughs> um, so, and, and so that, that gets hard. Um, but if, 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 if that makes sense, you know, I mean, Interior Chinatown was a screenplay, but before that it was a whole bunch of other things and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And it was like, oh, the background character who kind of wanders into a, a script that he's not part of, then that makes sense to me. And so, um, but if I, you know, if I sort of had to prioritize one, uh, it, it's definitely, I mean, in terms of, I guess, content, but uh, even sort of, Within that, I would say, like feeling, right? I mean, I, I don't. If I'm, if I write too long about sort of concepts, or if I'm getting excited about some sort of formal thing that I'm doing, a conceit, it it gets kind of like it doesn't sustain itself for long enough, you know. Like you can sustain that for maybe seven, fifteen pages at most, but for me anyway. Um, but I'm like a reader doesn't want to read that. I don't get interested, and so I usually have to remind myself, like, oh, right, the, the thing that makes this go is, um, you know, someone going through something or, or um, some emotional sort of story underneath it all. So, yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> so I don't have a specific question, so it might not come out like a question. Um, but I, I was thinking... I can't wait. This is going to be awesome. No. <laughs> <laughs> or I, you were talking about how um, writing for you was more like something you did in private or like in your like more quiet moments. Um, so I was interested in that shift from like having it be something you like keep contained versus like moving it to like the social or like wanting to have it 
um, published, if you like, can classify lit mags as social. Um, and I guess I'm also interested in how um, you mentioned you were writing sort of into your career um, and like without the support of like workshop, for example. Um, so like that question of like when you sort of like discern what you were writing was good enough um, to like send out. Yeah, that's a, first of all, that's a very specific question. <laughs> Are you, you're a writer, I bet. <laughs> no. You're not? She's oh. an award-winning writer. Oh. <laughs> Really? Yes, really. <laughs> ah, see, and you lied about that. You are definitely a writer. <laughs> that's that's right. Yeah, because that's, I mean, I feel like I would do the same. I would preface the thing, and then I would actually do, do the opposite. No, anyway, I think those are great questions. I, going back to your first one, I feel like, um, yeah, the, 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 for me, the challenge is like um, not writing for publication for not like how can you separate the impulse from like that ambitious thing of like I want someone to publish this, I want to, people to say this is good, I want to you know maybe even make a living off of this or or just have some kind of some some acclaim or recognition um, versus the impulse to do it in the first place, which is from if it's starting in that place, that's where it has to start, you know, and like. But I won't lie, that's a hard thing to navigate. I mean, I, I do think, you know, you can't, I mean, for me as a human, like, it's always going to be a little messy. It's always going to have, you know, the potential for getting ahead of myself or doing some, you know, motivations creeping in that are extrinsic to the, the thing itself. I'm not a, I'm not a monk or, you know, on a mountaintop. And so, um, but I, I feel like it does come through in the writing. You know, I feel like sometimes if I have an idea or I'm pushing something in a way that isn't true to, like, would I just write this for myself if no one was ever going to see this? The best things that I've had that have worked are the things that I, and I, people have told me this will not work. Like, I remember I got reviews of How to Live Safely where someone was like, who is this book written for? I, I think like one of the major trade publications wrote that. Like, I don't understand who the audience for this book is. And um, Interior Chinatown, I also, I mean, I said earlier I wasn't afraid of, but I was afraid in a way of like, I was like, this is so weird. Will anyone get this? Will anyone be like, why is it second person? Why is it in courier font? Like, what is this guy doing? And, and, and so I feel like those are the things where it, they mean the most to me and they, they, they didn't, I didn't like, I didn't think it was gonna have any kind of traction. So I think that's, that's where to me, like the reader can feel something that's real, honestly, uh, uh, often. I don't know that that's always true. And I don't know that, of course, there are things that are wildly successful that come from a very kind of marketplace driven thing. But just for me personally, and I suspect if you're asking the question the way you asked it, 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 it matters to you sort of like, is this going to, you know, like, will my stuff suck if I start to care too much about, and, and I think the answer is maybe, maybe not, but probably, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, you, staying true to yourself does matter a lot. And I, and I think in terms of like knowing when it's good enough to send out, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, you're saying, but like that decision, you kind of talked about it too, of like, okay, I should send this out. Um, I usually end up doing this thing where I I sit on it way too long, and then in like a totally impulsive random moment, I'll be like walking to make a sandwich. I'm like, I'm gonna send that out right now. And it's got all kinds of typos in it. And I'm like, I don't know why, but all of a sudden, and so I, I feel like there's a, it's a kind of navigation between the conscious and the subconscious. And like, I listen to them both, you know, sometimes one's right. Often I'm wrong, you know, often I was like, I shouldn't have sent that out. <laughs> so, um, and other times it's like you, but I, I also suspect, you know, if there's other very conscientious writers in here, it's like, you're probably holding on to it too long. And that's okay. I think that's okay to care. So it's, it's better to err, err that way than, than the other way. So that's not really practical advice, but I would say listen to your, listen to your heart. <laughs> this is when the karaoke portion of the, of the evening begins. Hello, I just had a question um, regarding your 
uh, process as an author, because I'm hoping to write a novel myself, and there are times where I come to parts of my book and I say, what the heck am I writing? This doesn't feel natural, this doesn't feel right, and I have complete block of where I should proceed and how I find like a human voice that something that sounds natural, uh, because oftentimes I'll have this block where what I've been writing for five, ten pages just feels like it's forced and it doesn't feel, it just doesn't feel good to me. So what, what are some uh, pieces of advice you have for authors who have that issue? Yeah, um, great question. I mean, I think, you've, I'm sure you've heard this, but I, it, there's a reason why everyone says it. I would put it away for a while because you're, you, you in a month is a different person and you will get the distance you need to tell if that's really not working. Or sometimes you're like, oh, that's, I don't remember it actually kind of working better than I thought. But I would also say if your impulse is that, probably listen to it. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I don't know if other people have the same experience, but I think you kind of know when you've hit on something. You know, it doesn't mean it's always right or always perfect, but you sort of know when you've tapped into something real. And if it's feeling kind of dead or wooden or just not true, um, it's probably a good reason for that. And, and, and the other thing is, you know, you don't have to throw anything away. I don't throw anything away. You know, I, I, I have all kinds of crazy drafts and what I call like carcasses. You know, I just have stuff that I'll just go back to. I'm like, oh, are you a thing? You know, I, and sometimes it is. But often there's a reason why it's kind of inert or it didn't work. Uh, maybe we'll take one or two questions more and then we'll, oh yeah, right here in the front. Sorry, this, she's been waiting for a while. Hello, you mentioned working with Wong Kar Wai, so I was wondering how you even got in contact with him, and, <laughs> and if you were to do a film or TV adaptation of a book, what book would you do? Oh, wow. That's, um, I just did like um, looked him up on Twitter. No, I just, no it was through... Um, into his DMs. Right? <laughs> yeah. It, it was uh, <laughs> through... Um, like a, the network was like, hey, we have this project, you know, and would you want to try to work on this? <laughs> I said, yes. Uh, and then there was a long process of like, I had to pitch a bunch of stuff and I think there's other people in the running and somehow I got it. So um, so that's how that happened. Um, and so yeah, it, it again, being in the right place at the right time, um, I don't know exactly why I was even on the list, but, um, and I take it you're a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, what's your favorite movie of his? Do you have a favorite? I started, I really liked Paul's version of HBO, because I feel like it's mm. on my face. Mm. And I figured out HBO has like three folders. Mm. So I watched it by myself, and I started with Jennifer Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, and then I watched it. It's a good place to watch Wonka Wai. Yep. It's a great, and I watched Chung King Express. Chung King Express, yeah. I don't agree with it. Yeah. I think Paul and Angel probably have a different one. What's What's your favorite, Charlie? It's probably, uh, well, it's probably Fallen Angels, but um, I agree, it's, it's, it's not as sort of like polished and emotional, but In the, in the Mood for Love is probably his sort mm -hmm. of, yes. Yep. First time I watched that, I'd sort of like, I just sort of walked around in a daze for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then your second question. Oh. Um, I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think probably something, this is not an answer, but I think I would be interested in trying something nonfiction. I think because maybe because I've been doing so much of adaptation, but like some cool magazine article, you know, about something I don't know anything about, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was interested in um, what your experience was in publishing your first book, uh, specifically, um, maybe like the time scale of how long it took you to write it, um, what the publishing process was like, if there was any hiccups, any stories, things like that. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, uh, so I started writing short stories, and I st okay, I'll give the timeline. So I started writing short stories in 2001. In 2002, I started sending them out to small literary magazines, um, and, and not so small. I was sending them everywhere. And um, I started getting them published about a year later. Um, 
and then over from 2002 to 2005, I published, I want to say, six stories, maybe, maybe just five. I can't remember. Um, and uh, one of them was in a literary magazine called the Gettysburg Review. And um, well regarded, I don't know what the circulation is, but it's probably not huge, but apparently an agent, a uh, New York book publishing agent, saw the story and was like, would you, do you have a novel? I said, no, and he said, okay, well, do you have enough short stories to maybe try a collection? It's gonna be very hard. I said, I think I do. Um, and I, I barely had enough, I think, for a book. It's a pretty skinny book, but I got, pretty much all the stories I had at that point, which is, you know, um, not that many, and it was, uh, but we, he somehow sold it to um, um, Harcourt, and they had a, at the time, a paperback um, original division, which is um, still a thing, you know, um, for a lot of short story collections or first time books, I think it's a much better sort of way in, because there's sort of, it, it costs the publisher less, you know, it, it's, a, it's a sort of, um, an easier way to enter, so it was published as a paperback original by by a major New York publisher, which was really amazing in 2006. Um, and so that was, you know, four, almost actually f close to five years after I was, you know, sending things out. And so that was my first book, and I was really excited. I remember it got a good review in Entertainment Weekly, which I was like amazed. And I thought, this is it. I'm gonna quit my job, <laughs> and and I remember you know like the Amazon ranking went up for about an hour and then it went back down, and and the book didn't sell many copies, but it did get a couple of good reviews. It got panned in the New York Times, um, which was really sad. And it wasn't even long. I guess it's more merciful, but it was a very short <laughs> review, but it was brutal, and um, that was very demoralizing. But that was my first book, and so I you know years later until I sort of stopped being a lawyer, but. Um, it was really thrilling, you know? It was really like a dream. I, I, I remember at that point, I was like, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> I published a book. This is all I ever wanted. And it kind of still is, to be honest, you know? Like, I, it was um, amazing. So if you're thinking of doing it, good luck, and um, hope to get to see it in a bookstore someday. Uh, third class superhero, uh, his right. first book was... <laughs> <laughs> One moment uh, is is amazing. Definitely go out and get it. My partner and I we never read that 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 uh, uh, that review that negative review. But we we talk about Moisture Man all the time. Um, if you know, you know. Uh, but yeah, Charlie, that wasn't awkward at all. That was <laughs> all right. Put your hands together and help me thank uh, Charlie you again. <laughs>